Hey folks. Hi. How are you doing? There we go. Now, I'll just give folks a couple of minutes here. We have the recording for others as well. Hey, Jesse, welcome. And if we just get folks to sign in, it would be great. I'll put the notes here. And I try to catch up with the comments on the PRs to date, just for fill material while we're waiting. <laughs> Do the, the five minute uh, wait here. Marina, did you have a link you wanted us to uh, look at? Or you just wanted to present? How'd you want to do your portion? Um, I think I'll probably just present. Um, I think it's okay. easier. Yeah. It's kind of, it's combining a couple different branches of Tuff right now, so. Oh, uh, no worries. All right, that looks like five. So Marina, you have the floor. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Oh, interesting. It's not letting me share multiple terminal windows, which is interesting. Um, you might have to share your desktop. Oh, yes. Yeah, there it is. Desktop. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, all right. Can you see that? That is that, does that look like it's, um, okay, cool. All right. So, um, so what I have here basically is, um, a basic, kind of register setup and a basically basic client setup, um, just to demo a couple of 
of tough features. So first of all, um, the registry has just like a basic, um, some tough metadata set up already with just a lot of different um, sample um, repositories within the registry just for, for demo purposes. Most of them are pretty empty, but they're just so that we have um, some stuff to work with. And then there's the top level metadata of root, um, snapshot, timestamp, and targets, um, which we'll get more into in a minute. And then um, um, a few example targets kind of within all those example registries. Just, just sorry, a few example um, artifact files within all those example repositories, just so we can show kind of how those um, move around and stuff. Um, it's pretty bare bones for the demo. And then over here on the client side, um, in order to demonstrate um, how it would look for a um, client that starts out as an ephemeral client, um, the only thing that is currently over in this client is this root metadata. And this can actually be even further simplified by just having the root key or keys um, available on the client. So that's like the only thing that this client needs to start out with in order for the system to work. And then, so with all that set up, um, I'll just host the registry here so that we can pretend it's on a different machine and it's hosting all this metadata. And then um, over here on the client, we'll download our first file. So um, client, let's download file. Sorry, just those things in the way. And then make some requests over there. And then over here, as you can see, there is um, the file one got moved over into the, the targets over here. And one thing I want to show over here really fast. So it downloaded, obviously, all the metadata it needed to download this. And one of the, the new features I wanted to show is this, um, is that you get this snapshot file and what that looks like. So, um, um, so the, the difference here between the, the snapshot and the um, classic snapshot, tough snapshot that you may be familiar with is classically the tough snapshot lists every single um, um, repository, every single um, targets file, targets metadata file on the uh, registry or repo and the version number of that so that you can't roll back to different versions because it keeps track of all these different version numbers. But there were a lot of concerns about um, things like private, re private repositories on a registry and being able to see all of that information as well within the snapshot file, as well as scalability for really large registries that may have a lot of different repositories and a lot of different things listed, which can make this really big file that would have to be downloaded every time. So to solve that, what this does instead is it uses a Merkle tree to provide the same guarantees of um, consistency across the registry of, um, of files so that you can't replay um, old files or mix and match different files on the registry, but instead it just lists this, this amount of information statically. And so the, the length of this tree path is um, proportional to the log of the number of repositories. So the only information that's leaked is the number of targets metadata files on the registry. What's not leaked is any information about what's in those files. And these are all secure hashes. And so, you know, you can't get any information about how those were made or what other um, artifacts are available on the repository. Does that all make sense? So what, how, that, how that kind of works. And then um, as I'll, I'll demonstrate that this still provides the same protection against rollback attacks. Um, so if we go over here and we, um, we copy the, um, metadata. Yeah. so if we copy this Wabbit's network JSON uh, metadata, which is the metadata that tells you information about this actual file one, which I can show you here. Um, it's the same currently in both places. So this tells you, this has the actual hash of the file and all the information about it. So if, for example, someone were just to, to look at this on the, on the network and they were to save this old Wabbit's network metadata file, so I'm just copying it into this, this other place, and then say, you know, we, we find a security patch for this, um, this Wabbit's network um, image and we want to, to make sure that it gets pushed to all our new users. 
So over here, we will update the um, registry. It's fabulous. So, um, you know, this is just an example file. In real life, this should be an actual, like, executable file. Or this should be the actual artifact information. Just for the demo, this is just um, a bunch of text. But um, so say we, we update that file so that it, it changes and that hash will no longer match because um, it's a new file. And then what we'll do here, mv2, so we'll sign the Rabbit Networks um, metadata. So this is just saying, okay, so we, we have to do this file and this is the new, um, the new one. We verify that this is correct. And then, so not only, this is actually doing kind of two steps in one script, just for simplicity. This is just having the Rabbit's Network um, repository sign this and, and verify that they, they attest that this image is what they want to be sharing. And then it's also having the targets um, metadata on the registry say that this is correct. And I'll show you in a minute how we can, how the, the repository can be independent of the registry as well. But for now, they're, they're the same. Um, so, so that's all that's signed. And so now we have like a local copy of this signed uh, metadata file that includes the new version of the image. So the next step is to, is to publish that. And so you upload it to the, um, the registry and then as it's uploaded, it's signed by the snapshot and timestamp um, keys on the registry. So that's kind of an automated process on a push. And I just separated that here for, for the demo. And then, so, so we have this new, new metadata file published and we could download the new metadata, but let's say there's an attacker who wants to reapply that old version. So, um, so we copy this old rabbits network JSON file back into the registry as the, pretending it's the real one. And then over here, if the client tries to download that rabbit network file just like before, um, it gets a bad version number error because the version number doesn't match the version number that's listed in that targets metadata file. So, and then I'll just go over here and re-sign this to make sure that um, the registry is back in a good state. Um, start demo and publish that as well. I type it correctly. Work okay, <laughs> and then okay. So 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 that that's kind of the idea of the replay attack. And so if you replay the old targets metadata, then um, the image can't be downloaded by the client. Okay. So next, I'll show you this other new feature that we um, that we kind of looked at, which um, I think it would be especially useful if you have some private registry or private repositories on the registry. Sorry, I always get that confused. So the um, so the idea here is that if, say, you are the runner of the Webit Network um, repository and you have your, your clients and you want them to trust the, anything signed by you, Webit Networks, but you don't really know anyone else on this registry and what they're signing. So you don't necessarily want everything on the registry to be trusted by this person. You just want the stuff that you, you attest is, is good and valid or secure or whatever your, your parameters are. So the way we support that is, um, Using this idea of a targets map file. So this is, um, is basically just on the client side, what it does is it says, okay, I trust anything signed by Rabbit Networks with this key. And um, yeah, so anything that is signed by Rabbit Network with this key is what I'll trust. And so it's, it basically it kind of overrides to in a certain extent the top level metadata on the registry itself because um, in some cases, you want to you want to get all of your um, key information from the registry. Like up here, what we were doing was we were using this key, but we were getting it from the the registry. And so the registry's root metadata was telling us this is the key that you should use to sign um, to, to you know to verify anything from Webbits Networks. But instead, we can give this directly to the client, and so the client knows themselves that this is what it, the key that I trust for anything from Webbits Networks, and then um, they can use that to verify. And so what happens then? is so they can so let's say they try and download something um so add the map file and they try and download um something from a different thing something that's not signed by rabbit network so say it's something from my repo slash image one which is um something that's available over here so they try and download that 
and it won't, it won't be found because of this map file that's blocking it. And actually, without the map file, um, just to, to prove my, my demo is accurate, let's see. So without the map file, um, oh. Well, that's weird, but it, without the map file, it would be able to download <laughs> the, the image one. This is probably a problem with my script, not with anything else, because of my, my demo setup. But um, sorry, but they are able to download something from WebNotes. Rabbit um, networks slash what is it called? File one. So that downloads just fine because it's available in this this target's map file. So I'll look into that later. Um, <laughs> there, so that so that's kind of how this map file works. So it 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 um, I think we think it addresses some of that the issues with that. Um, private repository situation. And another um, thing I wanted to do, just demonstrate really fast is um, key rotation and how that works within, um, within this system. So any key within the system can be um, rotated and kind of transparently to the client. So the client doesn't have to worry too much about um, managing keys or what's trusted, what's not trusted. As long as a threshold of root keys are not compromised, any key rotation can be done transparently to the client. So for example, um, where is it? So let's say that rotate. So we want to rotate this, the, who's trusted to sign. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to web networks. Um, I was going to do a top level metadata just to demonstrate um, how this works. So we run, so rotate timestamp. Size goes in there. Store slash timestamp. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically I'm switching out what is um, signing the timestamp key to be from the timestamp key in case there are multiple keys it has to specify which key is no longer trusted and then which key is going to be trusted in its place. So we're, I'm just going to use the snapshot key just to um, to show so you can see that they match and that it's being used. So so rotate the key that's used there. Oh, that's weird. Oh, nv2.py. And then that will, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm re-signing the root metadata using this new key. And the root metadata has two different signatures. So both of those signatures are now used to say, okay, so instead of just trusting this previous timestamp key, we'll trust this new key to sign the timestamp metadata. And then what I'm going to do really fast is um, update the script to use the, the new key rotation because timestamp is an automated um, process. So you have to tell the script which key to use to, to do that automated process. So I just updated that really quickly. And then um, and then so we publish this new metadata. And so then, so that's, that's all we've done here. And then over here, let's say we try and download a new file. I'm just trying, you know, the same file. And it, it works just fine. And the client doesn't know any different. But if you look at the um, repo, what you'll see is that it's actually using this new key. So this timestamp key is now matches the snapshot key because it's using the same key for both of these rows. And this is just done transparently to the client. And so in real life, you probably wouldn't switch it to the same key, you'd switch it to something new that um, is more secure or you know, uh, fresher or whatever. And, but this process can be used um, to do that. And then finally, the last thing I want to show is uh, moving an image from one repository on the registry to another repository on the registry. Um, and this, this would be very similar to move it to a new registry altogether. I just um, didn't set up a second demo registry, but I can do that in the future if there's if there is interest. So, um, so what I'll do here is I will move a target from, um, let's see, from repository zero, which is my very creatively named example repository over into this Rabbit Networks one. So um, currently there's the file one.txt in Rabbit Networks, and now we're moving also this file zero um, file into there. And then all we have to do next is, so the Rabbit Networks need to attest that they actually trust this file zero and want to want to sign it. So all they do to do that is say 
they just say they add the target. So they add um, this target and they're going to sign it with this key. That's what happens when I type this password wrong. It should be a prettier error message, but yes, that's, <laughs> this is what, yeah, so that's what happens when it doesn't use the key. Um, so yeah, so the, what I did here is I added the file to the Robert Network's metadata, and then I published this, um, this new metadata. Publish, and then, um, it should be available over here. So, what is it called? File zero. Oh, that's because the map file doesn't include that. But, it should actually work with the map. That's weird, but anyway, it, it, does, it is able to find it um, in, the, in the normal case. And so, um, yeah, so those are the big features I wanted to demo. I have a couple other things if anyone is, has more questions or wants to do something else, but I want to take a break now to see if, see, you know, yeah, any questions or anything. If there's anything that doesn't make sense you want to look at or anything, just let me know. So Milo has a question that he posted in the oh, chat session. Yeah, sorry, I don't have that up. It, I don't know if you could find, sometimes it gets hard to find the chat session when you're presenting. Yeah, I think. Can we just it, read it off? Sure, yeah, just for that. Yeah, this is, do I understand correctly that the rollback protection is achieved by splitting the snapshot data into a binary tree? If so, doesn't that still require serializing all repo updates over the full scope of the registry to update the root of the tree? Yeah, so it's, um, it is, uh, it's a Merkle tree, which is basically a specialized binary tree. So yeah, it is um, using them all, but the, um, so yeah, it does require some serialization. And I think the idea is that it doesn't have to be updated every single time any image is updated. Um, it can be updated once a day or so and still provide a day's worth of rollback protection, um, for example. Um, and that way you can do quick updates to things without having to regenerate that tree every single time. And then it would just categorize updates and update the, the snapshot and timestamp information on that cycle, kind of whatever time period makes the most sense. And I think that you all would probably know what time period better than I would. Um, something on, on the order of a day, every day or so, I think would, would make some sense. Um, it shouldn't be too computationally expensive. I think even every hour should work. So um, it would be done on that, on that cycle. And then in between that, um, images could use, you know, clients could either um, use some other sort of, of protection in the meantime, like they could just use, they could skip that check, they could, um, have a, a, a smaller snapshot file that just includes that piece that's used in the meantime. I think there's a little bit of room for growth there, but definitely it can be, it does have to be regenerated, but it can be, um, what's it called, grouping stages. Yeah, I mean, there's always, a, to be fair, there's always a threshold, there's always a window threshold of vulnerability and you just, we, we, can, just, we can never eliminate it, it's always minimizing. Yeah, so saying that to, like, however small it can be while still kind of making it work. I mean, as so I think the question that we keep on circling around is not the what or how, you know, because I know the Merkle tree is one way to do some more optimization, you know, you know, around lots of registries and sorry, lots of repos in the same registry and different registry operators categorize them somewhat differently. So there's, there's lots of questions around, you know, how do we do that in a perfect and reliable and scalable way? Yeah. I think the question that we keep on struggling with is why do I need to do snapshots across multiple repos in the same registry when they're not owned by the same entity? Yeah, so I think the big thing is that it just improves your security because if basically if you are downloading something from any of these different um, repositories on the registry you, and then you download something from any of the other ones, you get the same kind of rollback protection. Um, and actually one of the benefits of these, this Merkle tree solution is even an ephemeral client can get this rollback protection because um, they can check the, um, the hash of the snapshot even if they don't have an existing one on disk, um, which is pretty powerful. And so, um, 
yeah, so I think, yeah, the, the big thing is to, um, to provide that, that protection. Sorry, I lost track of um, what something else I was going to say. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, that, that was kind of the thing is, you know, uh, there's, because it, it's not just one really big registry, right? I mean, it's not just Docker Hub, there's Quay, there's, you know, GCR, there's everybody's private registry, you know, there's um, multitudes of registries that any one team works with. At the same token, they're not working with all of them. They're working with subsets of them. And it's not clear what benefit I get, especially if I have ephemeral clients where I have to get this stuff anyway. Like there's no benefit to having stuff pre-cached. Like if I have a long-standing client, I'm just trying to put the right context to it. And over time, I might read, you know, a dozen different artifacts from one registry. Mm -hmm. then sure, I don't have to get 12 of them individually. I can get one and I cover all 12 scenarios. But in and, but even 12 is still not 200,000 or whatever the number of repos are in something like with Docker Hub or some of the other yeah. ones. The, so it, it's not clear there's a benefit even for the longstanding. And if we get to the ephemeral clients where they're pulling one or two, maybe three um, artifacts from a much smaller scope of repos, it just, we're struggling with why should we try to figure out a perf scale security solution to something that we're kind of struggling with is, is it a problem? Yeah, and I think that that's definitely something we should continue to talk about. I think that the issue that, that you know, that we see and that we worry about is this issue of, um, of replaying metadata. And if, if, if you, even if you have an ephemeral client or whatever, if someone is able to take that um, just like a plain signature file or a plain targets file in the, the tough terminology and save that and then wait, you know, six months a year, another ephemeral yep. client comes up, they replay that, you know, then you have an image that's six months behind, um, which in the security standpoint can be really bad because there can be any number of security patches over that period of time. Um, so I think you need kind of something to ensure that the timeliness of, of the images. Um, and it's easier to do it across the registry instead of um, repository by repository because, um, it just gives you a bigger a bigger scale, and so it gives you more protection because it. Um, but I think that's the question. And you only have to do it once. Each repository you have to do it. You right. just have it. This one one metadata file once in the the um, in the top of a repository, and it takes care of the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I get the rollback protection. Like, I we get it. Like, it, it's certainly something we want to be able to add. The question is, is the scope, and and then whether it's one month or two months or three months. You know, that, that the yeah. longer the months, the more risk it has because there's vulnerabilities every day. So we totally get that. It's the the concept that it's easier for one across all isn't necessarily true because it's it's trying to maintain those at a scale of the number of updates they get pushed with also the assumption of what you have access to, because even as a registry operator, while we technically have access to everything that's in the registry, we of course attest that we're not accessing things that we shouldn't be doing. So while I appreciate that you're you know, making sure there's no, no everything's anonymized and so forth, um, we, are, we promise our customers that we won't do anything around uh, data across customers. Um, in fact, we even have new rules that are forming where uh, they don't want their data even to be used in anonymized portion, uh, portions. Um, there's some higher level security stuff that they're asking. Yeah. So again, it's not that it's, you know, it's code, right? We can write anything we want. The question is, should we? And I'm, I don't, I struggle on if I, why I need to have something across all repos as opposed to here's the repos I care about. And as long as each of them are doing their snapshot metadata, which they of course update individually much less frequently than the entire registry. Because at any one time, the entire registry is getting lots of updates. Um, so if we can break them down to small units, it's a much more scalable problem, which doesn't impose any of the security uh, data access concerns and performance concerns. Yeah, I think that the, the downside there would be for those ephemeral clients, because if they only download um, once from a repository, say, then the only protection they get is, well, they basically don't get that protection um, of that rollback protection, unless they do something to check that 
um, to check against some external source. And the thing that this Merkle tree provides basically is like kind of an external check. So um, if, if the Merkle tree hashes match up, then you know that the, um, that the, yeah, that is a valid metadata file that, um, and a valid version of the metadata file. But if, if the whole concept of an ephemeral client is it has nothing to start with. So, and it knows, a, it knows what it's being asked to pull. So as long as we have a way to say, of the two things that I'm going to pull, yeah. can I go get the timestamp information for those two things, then if I understand it right, I should still be able to get that same threshold of time across those two things. But yes, I've got to get two, but okay, I know I'm getting two. It's not like I'm getting 2,000, right? It, yeah. it, it's different problems we're trying to solve. Okay. Yeah, I think that um, definitely something we should talk more about. Um, the yeah, I'm trying to trying to figure out how to how to. Um, I, mean, I think you're trying to secure that. Hey, at any one time, this ephemeral client could ask for anything from the registry, and let's give them some, you know, good protection that they can just. So it doesn't matter which one they pull from, as as long as these uh, timestamps match, you're good. But that assumes that a registry can have access to all that information, which we're saying we can't. Like, we literally can't do that. It's not like from a not technical, from a, a security liability commitment to our customers. We are saying we cannot do that. Um, so that's problem one. So <laughs> no, all performance and reliability issues are irrelevant. There's no information about any other um, repository on the registry within the, the file. To store any kind of information that goes across multiple repos with multiple customers is the, the barrier that we can't cross. Okay, even if it's a secure hash that's basically around? Yeah, nothing. Like, okay. I, 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 I'm one of these larger calls when the actual customers get on. I, I re, um, I, I've been known to say Coke and Pepsi because those are obviously competitors and <laughs> I know they come out, so I might as well just be public when I say it. You know, and for those that are actually working at Coke and Pepsi, I'm trying to make sure you're staying secure. So. Please don't get upset that I'm using you guys as examples. Um, the we can never make we can never do anything that their data has any knowledge or intermixing or anything of their others in any anonymizer anyway. Um, so even if we wanted to, we have a challenge that we shouldn't be doing. But I, the the problem that I keep on coming back to is it's I'm not I'm still struggling on why we need to do that across multiple clients because it's it's not even that there's a single registry like customers work with multiple registries over time so it's not like hey if we can just get this for this one massive docker hub and it's the only one that's really out there great there's docker hubs there's PyPies, there's npms there's you know all of those but we're seeing more and more that the public registries one people want private copies of them mm -hmm. there's multiple public ones that somebody has to deal with so there's, in, a, in addition to everything else, at best, what you're offering is on a single registry, you can do all repos. And that's not really the, the bigger problem, much less do we... Um, I, guess, I guess another thing that you could do is, um, I'd have to think more about this, is basically you have the, the root and maybe like top level, whatever metadata for the registry. Um, just basically, because that, that just simplifies, I think the key management a lot to have kind of one top level thing that then is downloaded and used, um, except for obviously in the case of this um, this map file, right, or anything where the client already knows the keys they trust. But then you could also just you could do just the snapshot per per repository. Are you suggesting there's and again, it goes into details that I don't completely understand. Are you saying there's one snapshot key for the entire registry? Yeah. I mean, that's another thing that I, I customers want their own keys and their own management of that life cycle of their information. Yeah, because the snapshot is mostly, it's like a, it's more of a, like a server management password, whereas all of the target's keys, which are used to sign the actual um, information about the files are, are independent and they're, you know, they would be very specific to that, that one repository. I, like the, if, if I was trying to take something like Docker Hub and I want to say all the Docker Hub content that they, it's official content that Docker is certified regardless of where they got it from, and Docker wanted to put its certified key on it. Okay, that's for the Docker certified content. But for all the other content that's not certified doc by Docker, for instance, this Wabbit Networks one that we refer to, is, it's built by externally. It's sent to Docker Hub. 
Um, in fact, at, at first, it's not actually certified by Docker Hub because we're trying to show in examples of things. Um, so I wouldn't expect, I mean, I, I guess you could say there's timestamp data on that, but I, as a customer, even at a public registry, I'm not sure that makes a ton of sense. No, exactly. It makes sense in a private registry. And so like, but the timestamp actually doesn't have much to do with like, like rabbit networks themselves. They just say, we sign this one thing and we, we put it on this, on this repository or this registry. And then the registry says, okay, we, we trust you to, to trust this thing. And so we'll, we'll assign this to you and we'll say, this is when we uploaded it. This is like when we received it. And then anyone else who's downloading it can check that um, the time they're downloading it is within a range of the time that it was trusted and the time that it was uploaded. And if there's a newer one, then they're not trusting the older one, they're trusting the currently uploaded thing from Robin Networks. It's yeah, I, I get it. I just, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not seeing that as the priority scenario with all the complications that we keep on discussing. Because yeah. I don't know if it's as much of a problem for that one registry where I get something as opposed to, I'm actually taking it from Docker, I've been putting it in the Acme Rockets registry. So it's more important that the Acme Rockets registry is kept up to sync with stuff that's happening in Wabbit networks and how do I uh, sorry, in Docker Hub, actually. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something that the Acme Rockets just needs to be in, in charge of doing because that's kind of their, they, they can make it automated, they can do whatever. But if, if they're trusting it, then they need to continually test that, that they trust it. And that is something that they, they sign and they want people to be using. Milo, did I see you pop it in there? Yeah, I think the long-term theme is that there is a non-zero security improvement to go in the full registry but it's very hard to articulate uh, in a way that users could rely on it. But uh, another point is if the, I must admit that I've forgotten the details of the snapshot scheme, but if the overall idea is that the snapshot is signed and updated about once a day, and we get protection on the granularity of days and not for a protection of rollbacks within that day, well, we don't, really need a cryptographic structure for that. We just need to sign a timestamp every day with the current state. And that scales trivially because we can just do it for every single repo. And yeah. we, don't, we don't actually need even the timestamp key. We just can rely on TLS as long as it's not uh, governed by, by some CDN, which I'm afraid it probably is. That's good. Uh, but yeah, if, if we are going with the daily granularity, I don't, I don't think we need the Merkle tree at all and we get the same, same reg registry feature anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. And actually that's like the, the traditional tough method is to just list all of the, the kind of current state information, which is basically version numbers and, and the time in the snapshot. Um, the reason for this, this structure was just to keep the separation between the repositories on the registry while still being able to provide um, coverage of the entire registry. So yeah. If, if it is separated down, then that's no longer, I think, it's, yeah, it's just extra work. No, what I'm saying is, in the very traditional uh, system, the snapshots were managed by the individual individual authors, and they were sequential, and they, the snapshot key was managed by the authors, so of course they had to be consistent, but uh, if we are having the registry sign the snapshots, uh, snapshot versions every day, we can just sign the snapshot version along with the time, timestamp and that, that gives us the same rollback protection, doesn't it? Assuming all the clients have synchronized clocks, which is... I think it provides of, the rollback protection um, kind of the same way. The, only, the main reason for this additional structure, um, again, was for, for two big reasons, is for the scalability for... Um, if you have a lot of different repositories on the registry with a lot of different images, um, you want to make sure that this, um, like, because even just listing the, the version information can make a really long file. And so this, this shortens it. And it also um, allows for separation between the repositories. Because you only have to download for your particular repository. You don't have to look at every single one. I'll guess I'll go back to the Mercury paper, but for um, right now, 
I'm thinking I could just split the timestamps per repository and just not have a, 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 a registry wide structure at all. And wouldn't that work just as well? Um, that would be that would be going back to kind of the the um, Notary V1 um, model, and I think that the the main I think concern with that model was kind of the trust on first use issue, where if every single repository have, has its own base structure, you have to figure out trust for every single repository individually. Um, uh, no, I mean that would still be well, or that could be a registry wide root key, a registry wide timestamp key. But the timestamp key would be used to sign every repository separately. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, um, I'd have to look into that. I think, you know, think about it and stuff. But I think that might might work. That's interesting. Yeah. So you're basically giving the isolation, so no one repo needs to know about others. Well, yeah. the timestamp private key would somehow still have to be used for all the repositories. Would not allow you to serve parts of the of the registry absolutely separately. But then you already have a HTTP router at the front of the host name, so there is some something sh that is shared uh, anyway, I guess. Yeah, because if you're hosted in the same place, they they do share some information anyway, so they could share just the keys, but then have individual. Yeah, but there it's that's not. And sure. more importantly, it would be one direction. It would uh, get yes. the private key to the customer separate container, but nothing from the customer separate container outside. Coke yeah. is they, they, Coke's data is not has anything to do with what Pepsi's data is. There, there's some other data that happens to be used across both of them, but they individually have their own uh, security content, and that also keeps the isolation that from a in addition to the security boundary we keep talking about. But from a performance, I don't have to worry about any intermixing of different customers updating on in different intervals that I have to figure out how to correlate across all registries, across all regions, across all air gap clouds. It's literally each repo has its own isolation boundary that I can, as a service side, manage those updates individually. Um, and that, that's the only way we can get a healthy scaling, you know, across multiple regions, multiple availability zones, you know, multiple clouds and so forth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely think about that more. See if there's any anything I come up with. But I think from from first glance, it seems to make sense as a way to to break that up. Cool. Well, I appreciate you guys keep on iterating on different parts of it. So that, that's definitely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else have so uh, just for the sake of time, we've got you know 15 minutes left approximately. Um, I just wanted to leave time. I didn't have a new updated agenda. We have a couple of things that are in flight, but nothing that. Uh, specifically ready to kind of iterate through. Um, I figured just give a chance for folks to catch up with what we've gotten done already. Um, and if there's any questions, uh, it's the recording is good for people listening, but it doesn't work for asking new questions. So uh, I don't know if anybody else has been tracking what's been going on and has questions that we should address. Okay, that's cool too. Uh, and one of the things we always try to make sure is we're addressing everybody's style of communication uh, as well. So we have the Slack channel um, that we've been tracking for the Notary V2 work. Uh, of course, questions here and uh, any comments on the PRs. So we on the so just do it. We'll address it in every channel that we can. Um, on the tough stuff, but back to some stuff that uh, Mariana was uh, Marina is uh, presenting, we, we have been trying to make progress on some of the tough work as well. Uh, so several weeks ago, we realized that there's a lot of complications here we're trying to work through, such as you know these conversations here today. And we wanted to split this out from a phase one and phase two because there's larger end-to-end -end workflow pieces, which the tough metadata will be a part of, but we wanted to make sure we kind of covered other unknowns that we don't necessarily know. Um, and if you remember, we were kind of doing the Sagrada Familiar kind of model 
where we don't really know the whole piece. So until we, until we get sketching it, we won't really be able to communicate and everybody can look at it like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, it, for anybody that watched the uh, KubeCon talk, we talked about uh, a sketch of a bathroom. And so I had done the sketch of a bathroom and but before we went and built it, I showed the sketch, the model uh, to Justin and Justin's like, where's the bidet? It's like, I didn't thought, think about that. You know, we don't think about those in the US, not until COVID where we ran out of toilet paper. Uh, so we wanted to be able to get that whole model end to end because uh, we know there's some stuff around the tough metadata we have to think about. We don't know about the other pieces. So the, the latest we've been getting there is we have the signature object that um, we've been kind of working with. It's, we have updated with the JWT token uh, format serialization. The next pieces that we're working on is how do we get that information in and out of a registry uh, and there's been a bunch of conversations around, you know, what is the persistence format? Uh, what do we leverage that's already there? And how do we make additions? And there was some questions specifically today on, uh, Ram was asking some questions in the PR um, around the impact we have to make to a registry. So, and this one actually is coupled between uh, the notary working group that is focused on assigning solution that could work within and across registries. But we also need to make changes to a registry so that it also involves the OCI uh, working group as well. So we've been kind of uh, having one foot in each sandbox there to uh, make sure that the scenarios we're trying to cover for a notary uh, are covered by the distribution APIs. Uh, because unless this works across all registries, we didn't really meet the goal. Um, so we feel pretty good. We had a good call last week around that where we got a support to go down the index path. Uh, which means that registries that already implement index and have to do that tracking between two things, in this case, the signature and the artifact that it's signing, um, that hard part of doing reference counting and uh, garbage collection will tie into that infrastructure they're already building. And then the idea that a uh, index will be able to declare it is not just a multi-arc container image, but it is a signature object. It is a CNAB. It is a Another thing that we don't know of yet, that's something we've been wanting to do for the OCI RFX for a while. So the fact that we can leverage that for signatures uh, means that it's not just a hack for one thing, it's actually you know, a core platform enabler. Uh, so that's the path we're currently working down. And we're, uh, as you, for those that might be watching, if you look at the notary project under GitHub, um, you're starting to see some other repos get added there uh, because we need to make changes to uh, the NV2 client that we've been discussing, we need to make changes to, which is just our prototype. But then we, to make the end-to-end -end work, we need the distribution spec. We need, we thought we needed the image spec to update the uh, manifest and index schemas, but we're gonna move that into the artifacts repo. So you see the artifacts repo being added there. And then ORAS also, um, oh, and Docker distribution, which we already had. So the idea is we wanna be able to prototype these, the end end experience out under the notary project, make sure we're comfortable with all the moving parts so we don't get all these different groups randomized. And as we're comfortable with that end to end uh, changes that we would need, then we can make the appropriate, well, one will make the spec, uh, but then we could also make the appropriate PRs back to the, as a group, because we'll know what the end to end is and we'll know what the final PRs would look like back to those upstream repos. Um, the stuff we're thinking about with this phase two of the tough prototype, uh, we believe that at least from a registry perspective, we've captured like, I don't know if it's 80 or 90. Uh, so there'll be some more additional work we have to think about, but we believe from what we know today, it will accrue up. So we're feeling pretty good about that so far. Um, anyway, so that's the idea. We wanna be able to continue to iterate, do that model, see if we like it. Everybody's perspective can look at it and understand from their perspective what this thing looks like. Um, and if we're comfortable and as we find new things, we'll keep on iterating. And when we get to a stable state across all of those affected repos, we'll get the spec put together and do the upstream changes. So that's the progress we're at today. Um, the, the prototype that you mentioned in, in KubeCon, uh, is that the one uh, named uh, under, the, under the repository, prototype one or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So last week, I think it was last week, 
Um, we were trying to figure out where do we commit this because we were doing PRs on top of the PRs and top of PRs and different people's repos. It was getting crazy to figure out what exactly we would look at. Uh, we were going to merge it into the master in, of MV2 or main, to be fair. We've also changed things to main now. Um, but then we were debating, like, well, isn't the root of NV2 going to be a reference implementation? We don't want to stick the prototype there because we know the prototype will change. Where, um, and we don't necessarily want to just evolve it. We'll probably toss it, bring the relevant things over. So rather than create yet another repo for different prototypes, what we're going to do is maintain branches uh, mm -hmm. in the NV2 repo and keep the root available for the eventual uh, reference implementation. So right now you see prototype one because we were being very creative with the name and we just decided to get something done. <laughs> um, and uh, if we need to go down a different prototype, we can do that. And then wherever we wind up landing, you'll see uh, in the root of NV2. So I did push an update to NV2 readme, the, the, the main readme, just to explain what we're doing. So those outside of our group, if they just come in and look, they should be able to find the path. Uh, and that's the progress we've got so far. So yes, okay. stuff you've been seeing is in the prototype one branch. Yeah. Sound good? And just for those tracking, we also saw uh, AWS added uh, artifact support in ECR, which is awesome. Uh, because that is the base of a lot of this that, uh, and they've been working on it for a while. This isn't like a magic thing. It's something I know that's been working for a while. And Omar Paul and uh, um, Jesse and Sam and others were, have been working on it for a while. So that's a huge kudos to them. Uh, and just really, the, you're starting to see these things kind of roll out um, to be able to support these end-to-end -end scenarios. Uh, without boiling the ocean, we've also been trying to generalize, uh, is there some general metadata APIs that we either need for this or would make this a little helpful? Or if we had a metadata API on all registries, how would that impact a signing solution? Because at least the definition of metadata in my head is it's not something you would necessarily sign. Uh, if you want something like that, you can put it on the manifest itself, but it's just like you can add signatures, we would add additional metadata. And the only reason I'm even bringing it up here is it's playing into some of the distribution API conversations we're trying to have is figuring out like, how do we not keep on throwing stuff on here? And by the time we're done, we just have, you know, this Mad Max vehicle of things bolted on and it does rationalize and make sense. Um, that's about it. Anything else? Okay, well, we'll watch on Slack for the notary uh, v2 conversations and PRs and I'm hopeful we'll have some more. I'm hopeful we'll have some more progress on the distribution stuff by next week. Um, there's progress being made, but it's we've got just some churn happening that we have to kind of work through. Um, so we don't randomize too many people on the conversations we're having. Uh, so that's, that's about where we're at. And thank you all for joining.